Summary of Inherit the Wind by Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee. Inherit the Wind is a play about the Hillsborough Monkey Trial, which happened in the 1950s in an unnamed small American town called Hillsborough. This trial is based on some facts from the Scopes Monkey Trial, which took place in 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee. It brought famous politicians, lawyers, and reporters like William Jennings Bryant, Clarence Darrow, and H. L. Mencken to a small town to decide if a man should go to jail for teaching evolution in a science class against the law. In the play, a high school biology teacher named Bertram Cates is in jail because he teaches evolution as science. Rachel, his friend and possible lover, comes to visit him in jail. She asks him if he should keep fighting the law and tells him that Matthew Harrison Brady, a famous former presidential candidate, is coming to Hillsborough to make the case against Cates. Back in the town, men, women, and children sing holy songs as they get ready for Brady's joyful return. When Brady shows up, he says that he is fighting not just to put Cates in jail, but also to protect Christian religious teaching across the U.S. and stop some northern states from teaching the non-religious idea that people's ancestors were monkeys. Brady finds out that Rachel and Kate's know each other and pulls Rachel away to ask her about Kate's religious views. In the meantime, it is said that Henry Drummond, a well-known radical lawyer from Chicago, will go to Hillsboro to represent Kate's. Hornbeck, a liberal reporter from Baltimore, watches what's going on, makes jokes about the town's stupid religious views, and writes stories in support of Kate's cause. The trial starts, and Drummond, Brady, and the town's district attorney, Tom Davenport, choose the jury. One night, while the trial is going on during the day, Reverend Brown sets up a prayer meeting where he yells at Kate's, Drummond, and others who don't believe in God or want to question God's rules. Brady is surprised by Brown's passion, so he says that religious law is true, but rebels should be forgiven, not sent to hell. The next day, Rachel is forced to testify against Cates. She says that Cates has questioned the absolute truth of Christian teaching, especially when it comes to science. Rachel is led off the stand while crying, and Drummond tries to call scientists to speak about Darwinian principles. But the judge and Brady say that evolution can't even be explained in court because that would also be against the state law that says evolution isn't true. Drummond calls Brady to the stand as an expert on the Bible. He then shows that Brady's belief in the Bible's total literal truth is wrong and leads to scientific problems and logical and common sense fails. Brady finally gives up and says that he knows God's plans better than other people. This makes the people in the court think that Brady is a conceited fool, and he too is led away, confused and embarrassed. The next day, the judge announces the verdict, Cates is guilty. However, because many other American towns are following the case through newspapers and radio, the mayor convinces the judge to give Cates a light sentence. Cates is given a $100 fine and a $500 bail, which is paid by Hornbeck. Then, Cates is free to leave town. He isn't sure if he won the trial, since it looks like he lost, but Drummond tells him that Cates made the Hillsborough law look silly and encouraged other people to think for themselves and say what they think. After the trial is over, Brady tries to give a long closing speech to the crowd in the court. However, the radio announcer stops him before he even gets started by saying that the trial and decision are over. Brady is so upset that he has a seizure-like fit and has to be led off the stage. When Brady's death is soon reported, Drummond talks well of him, saying that he was a great man who thought he knew better than everyone else what God wanted and how people should live. Drummond also uses a Bible verse from Proverbs that Brady had already used, a man who troubles his own house. Shall inherit the wind. This means that a person must believe in the personal conscience of his fellow man in order to live and do well in society. Hornbeck doesn't like how Drummond defended Brady because he thinks Drummond is too nice and soft. In response, Drummond said that Hornbeck, like Reverend Brown, has closed-minded views and only wants to make fun of people who don't agree with him. Rachel walks up to Kate's and Drummond and tells them that she, too, has decided to think for herself. Her first step toward this goal is to leave her father's house and start a new life with Kate's wherever the train takes them. 
Drummond sees Rachel's copy of Darwin and a Bible on the judge's bench as he is leaving the courthouse. He pretends as if weighing the two volumes against one other, then smiles, puts them both in his bag and leaves to join Kate's and Rachel on the train. About the Authors Jerome Lawrence Schwartz was born in Cleveland and went to school at Ohio State and UCLA. When he started working as a writer, he dropped his last name and became Jerome Lawrence Schwartz. He worked as a newspaper and radio writer at first, then wrote radio plays with Robert E. Lee, who was also from Ohio and went to Ohio Wesleyan. Their first play together, Inherit the Wind, brought them a lot of attention and made them known as political playwrights who wanted to write about current political issues in the U.S., such as the relationship between science and belief, political power, and the right to say what you think. After that, Lawrence and Lee went on to start the American Playwrights Theater and to write another hit called The Night Thoreau Spent in Jail, along with 30-odd more collaborative pieces. Many of these plays are being performed today, and they have been rewritten to emphasize other, current issues in American society. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.